Well, coming up very young in this in this dance that today is called salsa, back in the day was called mambo. I had quite a few people that I that inspired me. They, I can consider them mentors. And there was one team that really I'd have to really give them a lot of credit for being really an influence and almost a real direct influence in bringing out to me the vision of what I'm doing today, which is now dancing professionally. And that team is Augie and Marco. Augie and Margo were a team that came out of the Palladium. They were just nightclub dancers. And they decided at a certain point in their dancing that they wanted to turn pro. And they got out of the club and went to school and started to study in ballet and jazz and flamenco. And they put, this, they put an act together which became a very, they were very well known and they, they became very famous. So much so that I understand they worked as an opening act for Sammy Davis Jr. for many years. They traveled the world. I understand they performed for three presidents. And the, the experience I had with Augie and Marvel was one time uh, a lady who I will speak about later, who was a real, I would say she was an instrument in my life to help me get started in this career. She took me to see Augie and Margo perform at the Roseland Ballroom. This might have been 1970, 1971. And she said, Eddie, if, if you see this team, they're going to inspire you on your way of what you'd like to be doing with your dance career. I said, okay, so I went there and I sat down. And the curtain opens and there's the Tito Puente Orchestra. The Tito opens up with, uh, I think it's classic bottle of Humberto or something. And then he gets on the microphone and he says, now I'm going to have my cousin Augie and Marco performed for you. And this team came out and they had a pull-out stage that they, that they would use. They pulled out the stage and out come Augie and Marco. And just from looking at them, I was like, I was mesmerized. I was like, beautiful couple. And they did, the first thing that they danced was not a cha-cha, they danced a blues, which I had never even seen what blues dancing was like. So Tito played this real sweet, soft blues and they did it these incredible lines and extensions and the, the, the lyric, the lyrical movement and the romance and everything. And I was just, I was just captivated, captivated. So after that, they finished, they came back a few numbers later and then they performed what I saw for the first time was a fusion of mambo with flamenco. And in this mambo flamenco, they, all, they had the flamenco styling and movements but also I noticed that Augie, he would like the ballet dance, he would jump up, I don't know what it's called, but he would do like pirouettes in the air and come down on his knee. And I, I just sat there and I don't think I blinked at all. I just sat there and watched this number. And all I can tell you is after this performance, when I left Roseland Ballroom, I went home and I said to myself, this is what I want to do. I want to perform with the Tito Puente Orchestra. I want to be a professional dancer. This is the team that I think really crystallized the vision and became my mentors, along with many others like the famous Palladium Mambo legends Freddie Rios, which I saw him dancing in the early years of the 70s in a club called the Corso. And then you had Freddie Rios, you had a guy who they nicknamed him Louis Machina, which had this incredible, incredible style of dancing and he had a, a, a swagger and, 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 and he had a certain style about him and the women were crazy about dancing when they police backing up. And then you had of course Cuban Pete. You had a guy named Tommy Johnson who did like this incredible jazz improv fusion between Mambo with all these contractions and amazing. And, and these are the guys I grew up with. I would go to the Corso and I would watch Jojo Smith, a jazz teacher, very famous jazz teacher in New York. And Jojo had the most beautiful jazz movements in his Mambo. So he was a big influence for me because I started like imitating. I, I couldn't afford classes, but I would watch him and just go home and kind of imitate him. And so they were, to name a few, they were some of the ones that really, really inspired me. And they were my mentors and they were the ones that really helped me to evolve the concept of what I do today and what I've been doing now for going on 50 years. The highlights of my career, well, that starts a very, very simple question. It starts off with the name Tito Puente. Tito Puente for me was probably the greatest inspiration in this vision and in this dream that I had to become a professional dancer. I 
many people don't know that the first opportunity that I was given on the professional level was by Pico Puente. And Pico Puente was someone that my mother tells me that when she was pregnant with me in the house, she couldn't go dancing, very poor, grew up very poor in the bathroom. But she says that she always had the radio on and they always played back in the day Pico Puente music. And she would dance around the house with me in the belly. So she says, you were raised from the belly with Tito Puente music. Okay? So it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me that the first attraction when I started to listen and learn about the dance, the first attraction that I had was the Tito's music. I love this music, I love his arrangements, and I love the fact that I, that now I understand that Tito, being a great dancer that he was, and a very talented dancer, he always arranged for dancers, he, his music. He, he even told me, he said, Eddie, when I sit down and write, I used to write my music knowing that dancers would be able to use this for choreography. And I, I, I understood that in the early years of my career, since maybe the late, or, or late 60s or early 70s, because I loved his music. And the first two pieces that I choreographed of Tito was the Tumbo El Cayuco, and another one which was entitled originally Puente's Nightmare, and then it became Palladium Days. They revamped it as a Palladium Days. And the whole thing with Tito, since I used to go every week, every week, without exaggeration, to the Corso on 86th Street, 3rd Avenue. Why? Well, first of all, it was a swinging place. Some of the greatest dancers were there, and they had the best music. One thing that they had every Sunday, almost whenever Tito was in town, Tito was the featured band, along with Eddie Palmieri or Pacheco. And so, since I love Tito's music, you would find me at the course room every Wednesday, every Friday, and every Sunday. So, since since my idea was I wanted to show the dance uh, uh, the dance talent that I have to Tito, I would dance purposely in front of the band and put on this whole show for him, so to speak. I, I, I was hoping that he would uh, notice me. And this was after I saw Augie and Margo, by the way. So every every time he would finish his set and come off the band set, I'd be right there and I'd say, Tito, I love your music. But I was always just complimenting him, not only because I was trying to get him to notice me, but I just really, really dug his music. So I would always compliment him. And one Sunday, which was a surprise to me as I'm saying this to him, he says, come here, says, let me ask you something. He says, have you ever considered doing professional dancing, working with your talent, and not just here in the club? And then I just simply told him, Tito, you don't know this, my dream in life is, 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 is to do what I saw Augie and Margo do with you at the, the Roseanne Ballroom. I'd love to perform one day in front of your orchestra. And he told me, well, you know, you have a partner? I said, no, I don't. He says, find yourself a partner, put some numbers together, choreograph some stuff. And he says, who knows, maybe one day that'll happen for you. All I know that, that was like almost like the green light, like telling me, here's... Tito went there telling me, hey, who knows, if you put an act together, it might happen, right? So, from that point on, I was like on a mission, a mission. I, 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 I had partners, but they weren't at the level or didn't have the same drive and the same uh, interest that I had to do it at a professional level. Until eight years after this conversation, this is 1970, more or less, 1978, I get a job at the Roberto Clemente State Park in the Bronx as a salsa teacher. I walked in, and this is really a story here, this is actually a movie. I walk in and I remember they had a balcony and they had a big gym and they had different things happening, basketball, gymnastics, and, 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 and karate. And all of a sudden, I'm looking over the balcony and I'm with my friend named Jackie, and I see Maria. She was part of a gymnastic uh, group and she was one of the instructors. She's sitting there with her little shorts looking all cute. And I just simply turned to Jackie and said, Jackie, you see that little girl out there? Yeah, the one with the short hair, the cute one. She said, that's my future wife. 1978. And he said, yeah, you, you keep dreaming. So here I go, I start teaching. About a month or so later, who walks into my room? Maria. She walked in like this, like the attitude. Like and she's just standing there. And immediately when I saw her, I was like, well, I'll stop beating. I said, oh my God, there she is. So I ran over to her and I introduced myself, I invited her to come in. And then I asked her, I said, do you dance mambo? She just real nonchalant said, yeah, of course I dance. So I figured this is my, my, my door to open up a conversation with her. So I said, can you put out some music? Would you, would you show me how you dance? She said, okay. So I put out some music 
And Maria starts flapping her arms all around and doing all this, what I, like, what I call little lie stuff. You're like, ah. And all of a sudden, I said to myself, okay, I said, this might be an opportunity for me to get to know her. I said, listen, Maria, why don't you sit down a minute and, and let me show you what, what we're teaching, what I'm teaching here and how the students are doing it. Maria sits down, I put on the music, and I start doing all these shines, all these steps with the students. And you can see that her face was like, she, she was embarrassed because she realized that this was not happening. <laughs> so then all of a sudden, uh, after, after I danced for like 10 minutes, she said, okay, thank you. And then she walks out of the room and I was like, hey, aren't you interested? She goes, no, no, that's okay, thank you. I didn't realize that she just basically was embarrassed because she realized that what she, what she was doing was not the hip thing. It was mom and dad's thing at home. Right. So after that, I did not see Maria for about three or four months. And I used to ask, have you seen her? She was, she was away in college. Out of thin air, she pops into my room months later, and she goes, I want to learn how to dance like you dance. I want to take classes. I was like, sure. So I figured I had a real task. So when I saw her flapping on, I said, oh boy, it's going to be a real challenge. She's just going. Little did you know that Maria not only had incredible dance talent, Maria was dancing since she was four years old, which I didn't know. She knew how to do tap dance, jitterbug, jive. She knew how to do hustle. The only thing she didn't know how to do was mumble. When I started to teach her and I realized how quick she picked up on steps and on routines, I said to myself, this is amazing. I thought that this was gonna be a real nightmare to try to teach this young lady. So immediately after like a couple of months, she was way better than everybody in this class. I simply told her, I sat her down, I shared my dream and my vision for what I wanted to do with my dancing. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm looking for a partner. And if you're interested in doing this with me, I would love to train you, blah, blah, blah. And she just said, real cool, like she is. She goes, okay, let's do it. And I started training her, and I one-on-one, -on -one, private lessons. And I'm telling you, in six months, I taught her two choreographies for her not knowing anything about the dance. I taught her Palladium Days and El Cayuco. And after I thought the, 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 the routine was ready and the act was ready, I told her, I said, let's go tonight to this club. Tito was playing at a place called Christopher's in the barrio. I said, let's go there and I, I'd like to give Tito my number and let him know and ask him if it's possible to do an audition for him. And we went up there. Tito didn't get in until about 1 o'clock in the morning and the band starts warming up and he walks in. And as I saw the right moment. I walked over to say, hey, Tito. Uh, how you doing? Do you remember me? He says, yeah, he says, I cannot forget you. I see you every week at the Corso, man. So, I, I, so I explained to him, I said, this is Maria, and I put, remember we had this conversation a long time ago? He said, yeah. He said, I said, is there any possibility that if, you know, I, I put my number here, if you could give me five minutes of your time so I can show you what I've choreographed and what I put together from your music. He turned around real quick and said, you know, I want to tell you the truth, Eddie. He said, I'm very busy. I don't know if I have the time to give you that private spot like that. Said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to introduce you to my musical director, whose name was Jimmy Fisauda. And he says, you can explain to Jimmy exactly, exactly how you want your tunes play. How, you know, if you want it like the record, explain to him. And in my next concert, I'll feature you and Maria. And I turned around because I freaked out, you know, thinking that he would do this. I said, Tito, you would give me a chance to go on stage and interview you without seeing me, my routine and my dance. And he turned around, he said, he said, bro, he said, Eddie, I'm tired of looking at you dance at the course. I know you can dance. He says, but you know what? He said, if I like it, who knows, baby? You know, we'll do something. And if not, then you had your chance. He said, it just like that. <laughs> oh, no. So no pressure, right? So then he, he tells me, I'm going to be doing something at a place which was known back then as the New York Coliseum, which today is known as Jazz and Lincoln Center, 57th Street Circle. So... Tell me, come here this Sunday, blah, 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 this time I'll be playing with the band. I did not know, Pete, that this was going to be something where it was a Latin expo and there would be thousands of people there, like the Javits Center. It was a huge place. I walked in there with Maria, and the moment I see thousands of people, because they had all these Latin products and they were giving away free samples, my knees started shaking. I was like, oh my God, I said, look at all these people. And Tito was the hired... Latin band entertainment for this for this event. So I go to the back and I find Tito's spot where he was set up. And you could only imagine. Here I am thinking, if he doesn't like it, this will be the first and last time that I'll do this. With him. And so 
I got to the I got to the uh, bandstand and I said, Hey Jimmy, I'm a, hey Tito, and then Jimmy says, Go get ready, we're about to play. Is this Tito gonna is gonna bring you on? Maybe like as a third number, he'll introduce you. So I go in the back and I'm getting ready, putting on my costume. And I to tell you this, I drove Maria crazy because I kept saying, Maria, you gotta be on point, you gotta be sharp, blah blah blah. And it was all it was all this nervous energy that I was letting out. And Maria's real cool, just you know, fixing up her costume. And at one point she goes. Relax already, okay? It's gonna be fine. I was like this, and Maria was like, "I'm sweat. So, all of a sudden, Tito, I, I'm listening to Tito on the mic. He's, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Now he's, now I have a surprise for you. He said, "This surprise is such a surprise that I don't even know what it is." <laughs> he said, "We have a, we have a young man here who, who I've seen dancing at the Corso, blah blah blah, and he's, he's going to do." A little dance if you like what we used to do back in the days of the Palladium, you know, because the course was after the Palladium. So he's introducing me, and I'm like this. And he says, They're going to do two numbers for you, and the first two they're going to do is a classic tune of mine called El Cayuco. So he introduces Eddie and Maria. Boom, we come out, we take a position, thousands of people around. He hits it, boom, 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 I'm gonna do my best. And as I'm dancing, every time I would spin or something, I would look at Tito. You know, Tito always had that smile. And I'm thinking, of, oh, at least he's smiling, you know? And the people started clapping, and you know, it started to look like it was going.